Uh, hi, my name is JJ Singh from Partap University, and this is a series of videos that will explain some algebra to you if you've never really studied algebra before. This is the place to start. You're probably in grade 9, I would imagine, at least if you're in the province of Ontario in the country of Canada. This is really aimed at people who are students in grade 9. Uh, maybe going into grade 10, uh, there'll be some topics covered that are grade 10 level. Of course, which country you study in um, greatly influences the um, the grade at which uh, this material is taught. So anyway, the textbook we're going to be using is called Elementary Algebra. It's written by John Redden, whose picture you see here. It's available at flatworldknowledge.com or you can get it uh, through the author's website which is right here edunettech dot blogspot dot com If you're interested in um, reading the author's preface it's, it's available here um, I'm not really going to talk about it too much it talks about the approach uh, with which the text was written now this text is, by the way, available for free um, as long as you're not using it for um, commercial purposes. It's available through what's called a Creative Commons license and actually uh, I'm not really going to go into that. Um, so let's just start with chapter one which is called Real Numbers and Their Operations. Section one is Real Numbers and the Number Line. We're going to learn how to construct a number line and put points on it. We're going to use that uh, number line to determine the order of what we call real numbers. We're going to figure out what the opposite of a particular real number is. If I give you a real number, I want you to tell me what the opposite of that is. And I also want to give you a real number and ask you what the absolute value of that real number is. And we'll explain all this stuff course in a, in a couple minutes here. We're going to start off with just talking about what a set is. A set is any collection of objects. If I have a bag in my hands, what I have in the bag is essentially a set of things. Okay, And you put these in within braces, which are these uh, curly brackets. Each object in there is called an element. So if you have red, green, and blue, uh, set of uh, colors. Red's an element, green's an element, blue's an element. A subset is any part of a set. So it's a, a set consisting of elements that belong to a given set. So let's say you have this subset, which is green and blue, uh, which is two of the three elements. Okay, Or you could have one of the three elements, you could have all three elements in the subset, you could have none of the elements. And if you had none of the elements in a subset, or a set for that matter, you would just call it an empty set. And so you wouldn't put anything within the braces. Or there's another symbol you can use, which is like a zero with a line through it. Okay? So when we talk about math, we talk about sets of numbers. When you first learned how to count, you were counting using natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, etc. That's what the three dots means is just keep following that that pattern. It's an ellipsis. Okay, so and that means that these numbers go on forever uh, until you hit infinity, which of course you never do, but more about that uh, in other topics. So what happens when you've learned these numbers? The next thing you probably learned is that there's also a number called zero, which comes before one. So at that point, you'd learn the whole numbers. So instead of the set n, you learn on you went on to the set w. And of course, there's negative numbers too. And so you've got the set z or z, which includes all the negatives and the positives, and of course zero in the middle. So those are all called integers. Okay. So an integer can be a positive integer or it can be a negative integer. And notice that within this set of integers, you have contained within the, the set of whole numbers. And within the set of whole numbers, you have contained the set uh, of natural numbers, or you could call them subsets. 
Okay, you could say my my entire set is my set of integers. I got a subset which is these whole numbers. Uh, I've taken the negatives negative integers out of uh, end up with whole numbers. I take the zero out, I end up with a smaller subset, uh, which is just the natural numbers. So, basically that's what it says here. The sets of natural and whole numbers are both subsets of the set of integers. Okay, now what are rational numbers? Rational numbers happen when you basically take two of these integers and just divide one by the other one. But the one in the denominator cannot be zero because anything divided by zero is undefined. So you can have zero in the numerator, but you can't have zero in the denominator. So you just pick any of these two integers and divide one, one by the other, and you'll get a rational number. So a rational number is any number of the form a divided by b, where a and b are integers, and b is non-zero. Okay, basically b can't be zero. So decimals that repeat or terminate are rational. Okay, 7 divided by 10 gives you a decimal that terminates, means it stops. 0.7, that's it. 1 divided by 3, though, gives you 0.33333, which you can indicate is repeating by putting a line over it. And that is also a rational number, because it's a repeating decimal. So if you divide an integer by 1, you get that same integer, right? And so that's also a rational number because it's it's equal to one integer divided by another. In this case, the denominator is one. So any integer can be written over one, and so any integer is a rational number. What are irrational numbers? They're numbers that cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. So these include non-terminating decimal numbers, like pi. Uh, pi is quite an irrational fellow. 3.14159, da, 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 da. It goes on, it does not repeat, so it's irrational. You've probably seen people write pi is 3.14, uh, and they just end it right there. Or some people even write 3.14159, and they end it right there. Those are rational numbers, but remember those are approximations of pi. They're not actually the real pi. Uh, somebody could write 22 divided by 7 and say, okay, well that's pi. But that's just an approximation of what pi is. It's not the actual irrational number of pi is. It's a rational estimate of pi. Also, if you take a square root of certain numbers like 2, you'll end up with uh, this number 1.41421, etc., etc., non-terminating decimal. Again, square root of 2, irrational. So the set of real numbers is all these irrational numbers and all the rational numbers. Okay. So remember, within the rational numbers, we had integers. Within integers, we had whole numbers. Within whole numbers, we had natural numbers, right? So that's all this rational stuff over here. And you also got the ir irrational numbers over here, and in total, it's all real. So um, there's also a, another kind of numbers where you start taking square roots of negative numbers, and that's uh, something else, but that those aren't real. So those are imaginary. So anyway, these are the real numbers, the rational ones, the irrational ones, ones where you have non-terminating decimals are irrational, ones where you have terminating or repeating uh, decimals are rational. A number line is basically a line which allows us to show where these numbers are, uh, and it shows us the order in which the numbers go. Zero is going to be in the middle, we're going to put negatives on the left, positives on the right. Okay, here we're marking off, in this case, integers, but between these integers are various other rational numbers, right? Fractions and so on. So zero is neither positive nor negative. It goes in the middle. It's always the most important part of a number line. You want to see where zero is because that's the point at which you go from being positive to being negative or from being negative, whoops, sorry. That's the point at which you go from being negative to being positive or you go from being positive to being negative depending on which way you're going. And you'll notice that the further away you get from zero, the more negative you're getting this way. Or if you, the further you go away from zero this way on the right, the more positive you're getting. 
So this will lead all the way up to positive infinity, or what we just called infinity on this side. And it will lead to what we call negative infinity on this side. And positive infinity and negative infinity are numbers which you never actually reach. Okay. So anyway, you could draw this number line using different scales. Here, instead of including every integer, they're including every uh, even integer. They're leading, leading, uh, leaving the odd integers out. So they have a space of uh, 2 between each, each mark. Okay, or here you could have a space of 1 seventh in this case, just to indicate that there's different scales you can use. Um, now, this is a graph. Uh, a partial graph of the set of integers, which remember we called Z. Remember when we were way up here, we said the set of integers is called Z. Okay, so now we're just going to do a simple assignment. Graph this set. Remember, a set is a series of elements, or I should say, just a, a group of elements within a set of braces. So you got negative one, negative a third, zero and five-thirds, or positive five-thirds. So here the way we construct the graph is we're using a scale with one-third between each tick mark, which is a way in which we can get these fractions involving thirds going so that they they end up nicely on our, our little number line here. So we got negative one here, we got negative two-thirds, nothing there. Then we get to negative one-third, we have a mark there. Then next is zero, we have a mark there. I go one third, two thirds, one, four thirds, five thirds, and we have a mark there. Okay? So when you're ordering real numbers, the larger number is always on the right of the smaller one. Okay? So smaller numbers, or in this case more negative numbers, are considered smaller. You'd call them more negative, but that doesn't mean they're bigger, they're actually smaller. So negative 5 is smaller than negative 1, so it goes on the left of the bigger number, and the bigger number goes on the right of the smaller number. Okay. So now we're also going to talk about equality relationships. Is something equal to something else? Is it not equal to something else? Or is it approximately equal to something else? Remember we had those estimates of pi, which are approximately equal to pi, but they're not actually equal to pi. These symbols are used and interpreted in the following manner. 5 is equal to 5. 0 is not equal to 5. Pi is approximately equal to 3.14. Okay. Next, we'll talk about an order relationship as opposed to an equality relationship. We're going to go a little further now. A um, little more subtlety here. One number being smaller than a number, another number can also be uh, one number being less than the other number. Okay, and a number A being bigger than a number B can also be expressed and should be actually expressed as A is greater than B. Okay, what if A is either smaller than B or it's equal to B, then we call it less than or equal to. If A is either bigger than B or it's equal to B, then we say it's greater than or equal to these symbols allow us to compare two numbers. So here you've got negative 120 and negative 10 and this is a more negative number than that one and so it's a smaller number and so it's less than this one. So negative 10, 120 is less than negative 10. And over here we just show the opposite. Negative 10 is a less negative number than negative 120 so it's a bigger number so it's greater than negative 120. Negative 10 is greater than negative 120. Similarly, since the graph of 0 is always to the right, the graph of any negative number on the number line 0 is greater than any negative number. So any negative number is going to be less than 0, or 0 is going to be greater than any negative number. So here, 0 is greater than negative 50. Now, these are strict inequalities when you say less than, or you say greater than. Those are strict inequalities. But you could also have inclusive inequalities where a number could be equal. It could be bigger or it could be equal, or in this, in this case. 
in this case it, it's it's either smaller or it's equal to okay so this is why we could say negative 10 is less than 0 and we could also say negative 10 is less than or equal to 0 okay here we've got the option negative 10 is either less than 0 which in, of course it is or it's equal to 0 which is another possibility but in this case it isn't so you could use either symbol you could use less than or you could say less than or equal to now the or equal to part allows us to do something like this where here we have the number on the left and the number on the right are the same number so we could say less than or equal to okay here we've got negative 10 is less than 0 and it and so it fits in the choice of it's either less than or it's equal to and here negative 10 is equal to negative 10 so it also fits in the choice of it's either less than which it isn't or it's equal to which it is so the, the logical use of the word or requires that only one of the conditions need be true the less than or equal to okay so here we're going to do a fill in the blank question you got negative 2 and negative 12 negative 2 is a less negative number than this one so it's bigger so it's greater than negative 2 is greater than negative 12 you could also say negative 2 is greater than or equal to negative 12 because it fits in one of those two options is it greater than negative 12 or is it equal to negative 12 yes it is greater than negative 12 no it isn't equal to negative 12 so it is greater than or equal to here they just asked us to use one of these strict uh, inequality symbols so we're going to say negative 2 is greater than negative 12 okay and on graphically we can see that it's to the right numbers to the right they're bigger numbers to the left are smaller um, now in the textbook they'll, the author John Redden will often point out that the uh, there's an equivalent notation used to express mathematical quantities electronically on a keyboard okay so if I'm typing somebody an email I may not have access to the symbol that says greater than or equal to so I will put a greater than sign and then I'll put an equal to sign this should be an equal to sign it looks like it's a subtraction sign but it's it's not um, at least I wouldn't use it that way maybe this author uses it that way but I would put greater than and then I would put an equal to sign and similarly with less than I would put less than and then an equal to sign so it means it's less or equal here it means it's greater or equal not equal to he's saying you can use an exclamation mark before the equal sign so and that doesn't just apply to writing an email you can also use software or calculators that sort of thing uh, using this notation in certain cases so what's the opposite? The opposite is basically something that's the same distance from zero as the number you're talking about. So if I give you a number a, how far is it from zero? Well, it's a minus zero. That's how far it is, which is a. a minus zero is a, right? But you could also be a far away and be on this side. This distance is also a, right? Zero minus negative a is equal to 0 plus a which is a so this, this is also a so opposites are like a mirror if you have a mirror here at 0 somebody standing this far away from the mirror on this side the image that they see on the other side is also standing this, this far away from, from 0 so the opposite of 10 is negative 10 the opposite of negative 10 is 10 so now we're given the number negative 7 and we want to figure what the opposite of that is we just basically multiply by negative 1 whatever the number is that you want to find the opposite of you just multiply by negative 1 and that will tell you what the opposite is so 10 times negative 1 is negative 10 negative 7 times negative 1 is positive 7 and again it's same distance away from 0 7 units from negative 7 to 0 because 0 minus negative 7 is 0 plus 7 which is 7 or on this side you got 7 is 7 away from 0 because 7 minus 0 is also 7. So here we have the opposite of negative 7 is negative negative 7 or negative 1 times the number. We just put a negative sign in front of these these brackets and basically it's the same as negative 1 multiplied by that 
negative and another negative being multiplied just cancel each other out, so you get positive 7. This idea leads to what's often referred to as the double negative property. So for any real number, remember what a real number is, it can be a rational number, it can be an irrational number, and if it's a rational number, it can be, uh, let's just go back up here and show you. Um, if it's a rational number, it could be an integer. If it's an integer, it could be a whole number. If it's a whole number, it could be a natural number. So, anywho, uh, where are we? For any real number, like let's say we have pi, okay? Um, negative pi times negative 1 is pi, right? Now, it's not a uh, rational number, but we can still do this. So, any real number can do this with, okay? What's the opposite of negative three-fourths? You can just multiply negative by negative three-fourths, negative, negative, cancel out, you get three-fourths. Simplify negative, negative four. Here you don't actually have negative four in the middle. You have negative times four, which is actually the same as negative four. And you have another negative times that. Multiply by that. So negative times negative is cancels each other out. It's positive. So you get positive 4. All right. Again, here you got negative, negative, negative 2. So this negative and this negative cancel each other out. So you get 2 in, within the brackets. And on the outside, you got a negative. So negative 1 or negative times 2, which is negative 1 times 2, is negative 2. OK. So if there's an even number of negative signs, the result's positive because each pair of negatives cancels each other out, right? So if it's an even number, it's going to have a bunch of pairs of negatives in it. If it's an odd number of negative signs, that means you have one more than an, than an even number, right? An odd number is one more than an even number. So here, the even number of negative signs cancel each other out, negative times negative positive, and then you also got an extra one that's what makes it an odd number of negative signs, because if you have an extra one that does not cancel out to become positive, that leaves the, the result as a negative number. So the result is negative if you have an odd number. So here you got an odd number, negatives, in front of a 5, so it's just going to be negative 5. Okay, there's a video here if you want to watch it. Uh, absolute value of real number A is denoted uh, bar a bar. Okay, I'm just going to call bar or pipe or whatever you want to call it. These are just basic absolute value marks. They're long lines on the left and on the right of a number. And basically, absolute value is telling you how far is this number away from the origin, which is what we call zero, the origin where everything starts. So, Remember how we were talking about the mirror image is just as far away from zero as as the uh, as the as the actual person is if you're standing on one side of a mirror. So you could be standing on this side of the mirror, you're four units away. You could be standing on that side of the mirror, you're four units away, and your mirror image is just as far away, right? So the absolute value of a number tells you how far away it is. So this is negative four. The absolute value of negative four is four. This is positive 4, the absolute value of positive 4 is also 4. Okay? So, here we got absolute value of negative 12, well that's going to be 12 units away. Here we got the absolute value of 12, that's also going to be 12 units away. So, note that the absolute value of 0 is 0 because how far does 0 have to travel to get to 0? It doesn't have to travel at all, so it's, its absolute value is 0. The absolute value can be expressed con Textually, using the notation ABS, okay, ABS short for absolute value. So we often encounter negative absolute values like negative times absolute value of three, or negative absolute value of three. So remember, the absolute value of three is just how far is three from the origin, which is three. You multiply negative, which is basically negative one, times three, and you get negative three, okay. So here negative times absolute value of 3 is negative 3. And here, because the absolute value of negative 3 is the same as the absolute value of 3, this is how, how far is negative 3 from the origin? Well, it's 3 units away, right? 
So that's still 3. This is a negative times that. It's a negative 3. This is also a negative 3. So don't confuse this with the double negative property, which is a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay? Here we're bringing in absolute values. It changes the game. Here, if you'll notice, we have a negative times the absolute value of something. So let's just cover this negative up for a minute and we'll just focus on what's inside the absolute value signs. What's inside the absolute value signs is a negative times a negative 7. Okay, here we do have a double negative property. Here we have these two negatives canceling each other out. We're left with 7. 7 is all that there is within the absolute value signs. Okay, that's what this is telling you here. What is this negative sign doing out here? Well, remember, we haven't touched that. It's still out there. Absolute value of 7 is 7, because how far is 7 from the origin? It's 7 units away. Negative times that is the same as negative, negative 1 times that, which is negative 7. So, let's say we don't know what the number is, but we know the absolute value of that number is 5. It means how far is the number from zero? Well, it's five units away. Could be five units on the right, could be five units on the left. So that number could be positive five or it could be negative five. Right? So absolute value of negative five would give us five, five units away. Absolute, absolute value of positive five would also give us five. It's five units away. So the answer would be plus or minus five and that's a set containing those two values. It looks like it's one value written here, but it's actually two. There's the five, and there's the negative five, and that's the set. Okay? So, what if you have an absolute value of a number? You don't know what the number is. The absolute value is negative five. That means if you want to figure out how far the number is from the origin, it's negative five units away. Is it possible for something to be negative five units away from something else? If if I call you and I say, where are you? And you say, well, I'm negative five units away from you. Is that possible? No, not possible. So here there's no solution. And so we say the solution is the empty set, which is like a zero with a line through. But it's not actually a zero. What did we learn? We learned that any real number can be associated with a point on the line. We learned that you create a number line by first identifying the origin and you mark, mark off a scale uh, appropriate for a given problem. Okay, so if you're looking at fractions of uh, nine, like one ninth or three ninths or negative five ninths or something like that, then you'll probably want the scale on there that, that goes zero, one ninth, two ninths, three ninths, four ninths, so on. And on the other side, zero, negative one ninth, negative two ninths, negative three ninths, negative four ninths, so on. Um, so that you can show it nicely. Uh, on on the number line, the the numbers that you're trying to graph. Negative numbers are on the left. Positive numbers are on the right of zero. Smaller numbers are on the left. Bigger numbers are on the right uh, of each other. The opposite of a positive number is a negative number. The opposite of a negative number is a positive number. Absolute value of any real number is always positive because it's defined as a distance from zero. Okay. The absolute value is zero, zero, because zero doesn't have to travel anywhere to get to zero, so the distance is zero. There's a bunch of questions you can do here. Um, the answers to the odd questions are listed. The answers to the even numbered questions are not listed. And where are the answers here? They should be at the end. Just practice this stuff on your own. There's some things for discussion for which you won't have the answers, uh, like researching and discussing the history of the number zero. This kind of stuff uh, I'm not really super concerned with, so I'm not going to talk about it really at all. But anyway, that's those are the last discussion, the last of the questions, the discussion questions. And then you get the answers here for the positive questions. So... That's the end of the first part.